Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today is literally such a mystery and probably one of the most bizarre cases that I've ever looked into. But before we get into the video, I just wanted to go ahead and say a big thank you to today's sponsor, Harry's. What do you buy for the guy who pretty much has it all? I know that so many guys in my life will say that they don't want anything for Christmas or for whatever holiday because if they needed it, they have already bought it for themselves. No matter what guy you are shopping for, your dad, your brother, your partner, how often do you end up getting them the same kind of cliche gifts like a wallet or a pair of socks? Well, this year you can make it different and special for whatever guy or honestly girl that you're shopping for with Harry's gift box. Their gift box is so cool and comes with everything they need for a close, comfortable shave and it can be personalized. I am so excited because I have one of their awesome gift sets to show you guys. I have the Winston gift set, which includes their limited edition Winston handle, which I will show you. This is just so gorgeous and it gives you the option to engrave, which I think is really cool. And it comes with three German engineered blade cartridges, each with a flex hinge and a lubricating strip to give you the most close, comfortable shave possible. Then it comes with a foaming shave gel, just like this one. It gives you a pretty good amount. And then you get a blade cover to protect your blades when you're on the go. And again, this super handsome recyclable gift box. I think this is a really cool gift because it's something they'll actually use and it's different than normal gifts that are usually given every year. These razors last so long that they'll also save on shaving all years with refill starting at only $2. Plus, they ship directly to him, so it's basically the gift that keeps on giving. I am definitely going to be buying one of these for a man in my life. I am not saying who because he might be watching this video um, because I want to keep this one for myself because I love men razors, I think they actually work so much better than women's razors. As you guys have heard me talk about so many times in the past, I used to get really intense razor burn on my legs even when I would buy the most expensive women's razors that I could find. Then I switched to men's razors, which did help, but I still always got a little bit of razor burn no matter what. I have literally never been able to shave without getting at least a little bit of razor burn, which is always super uncomfortable and it makes me not want to shave as often as I should. But I am literally not kidding you that after switching to Harry's, I did not get razor burn and it was the smoothest shave that I have ever had. I actually had to check after, you know, I was shaving to make sure it was actually working because it felt so smooth. Now I will never be going back to ordinary razors ever again and I feel like such a mom getting so excited over razors. It's so cheesy, but I've never shaved without getting razor burn before, so I so strongly believe in this product and this brand. It is something that I've been really excited to tell you guys about because, again, it works so well for me, and I really think it'll work well for you, too. I also love that Harry's, as a company, actually gives back, giving 1% of all sales to organizations that help mental health for men and veterans, which, as you guys know, is something that is so, so very important to me. What I am so excited about is that viewers of this channel can actually get five dollars off of their holiday shave kit plus free shipping by going to harrys.com slash rachel shannon they'll be so thankful that you've introduced them to such an amazing razor that provides them with the closest smoothest shave they've ever experienced with this deal set start at only fifteen dollars so honestly it's a no-brainer for me so again make sure you head over to harrys.com slash rachel shannon to get five dollars off of any gifting set while supplies last thank Thank you again to Harry's for sponsoring today's video. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the mysterious death of Rodney Marks. Rodney David Marks was born March 13, 1968 in the small coastal town of Geelong, Victoria in Australia. Those who knew Rodney described him as being brilliant and witty, which is an absolute understatement. By the age of seven, Rodney was doing crossword puzzles with the help of a thesaurus. In high school, he had a scholarship to a prestigious private school in Geelong where his interests in math and science grew. He went on to attend college at the University of Melbourne in Australia. 
then went on to the University of South Wales for his PhD, and went on to become an astrophysicist. However, Rodney was not your typical nerdy scientist. He had longer hair, had a rangy beard, dressed in a goth style, and was described as a free spirit. He loved to paint his fingernails black. He dyed his hair purple at one point and played guitar for a heavy metal band for a while. Now, from 1997 to 1998, Rodney had wintered in Antarctica to work for the Center of Astrophysical Research, an Antarctica South Pole Infrared Explorer project. There, he worked with an infrared telescope and collected data for his thesis. He would also help teach lectures on astronomy and tutored other students in French. He was loved by those around him because he was just one of those people that you could get along with so well and was so good at connecting with people who didn't know as much about this complicated subject as him. He was really good at explaining all of these really difficult concepts in ways that his students could understand, and other people really appreciated him for that. That. He loved his time working there, and one of his fellow researchers, Dr. Chris Martin, said that Rodney loved working there so much that he wanted to go back to Antarctica and he could not wait for his opportunity to go back. So in 2000, 32-year-old Dr. Rodney Marks decided to go back to Antarctica to work for the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, working in the Antarctic Submillimeter Telescope and Remote Observatory Project in the Biomed Research Facility at the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station which is the southernmost continually inhabited settlement on Earth. The research project that Rodney was working on was through the University of Chicago, but the Amundsen Scott Pole Station is ran by the National Science Foundation in the U.S. His job was pretty much to collect data with this massive infrared telescope and then use this data to help improve viewing conditions in the South Pole. His work was very highly regarded and he was making breakthroughs in the ways that we can see cosmos from Earth. Antarctica is known as being one of the best places on Earth to study space, so many astronomers would go out there for different projects. But as you can imagine, this facility was in a completely isolated area. There were no stores, no hospitals, or any other buildings nearby. So people who do choose to work there are very, very dedicated individuals who devote so much of their time and lives to their projects. Even his fiance, Sonia Walter, decided to work on base as a maintenance specialist so that she could be with Rodney. Only 49 people lived on base, so naturally, people who lived there grew pretty close. Once again, while working here, Rodney was known by his colleagues to be charming and was absolutely loved by those around him. While he was there, he joined an on-base band called the Fanny Pack and the Big Nancy Boys. One friend, Darren Schneider, another physicist who was also the only other person from Australia on base, said that Rodney had a very dry sense of humor. Not everyone always understood his sense of humor, but the second someone would take one of his jokes the wrong way, he always went out of his way to try and make things better with them. He was very well liked by those around him and he really enjoyed what he did. Now, like I said, this base is completely isolated. There are no other humans for hundreds of miles and eight months out of the year, it's even too cold to land a plane there. So of course, because of how desolate the area is, they had doctors who lived on base and medical equipment that was readily available in case anything were to go wrong. However, for Rodney, being at this station was ultimately what resulted in one of the most mysterious deaths in our history. On May 11th, 2000, Rodney was making his way back to base from the observatory when he started to feel a little bit ill. Now, when you're working at a place like this, it's very common that people can get sick or just start feeling a little bit ill while adjusting to the negative 80 degree weather and the 24 hour darkness that Antarctica has in their winters. But Rodney knew that what he was feeling was not normal. At around 6.30 p.m., him and Sonia went to the galley to eat a small meal and he drank a can of beer. He mentioned to Sonia at this point that he wasn't really feeling well, saying that he started to feel like he couldn't breathe properly, his vision was starting to get a little bit blurry, and he started to feel a little bit weak. By 9.30 p.m., they made it back to their room, and at this point, he was extremely tired, so he just thought that maybe he could sleep it off and would feel better in the morning, so he went to bed early that night. However, at around 5.30 a.m. that next morning, he woke up and was starting to puke blood. 
still feeling absolutely horrible, he went over to the base's physician, Dr. Robert Thompson. However, after explaining his symptoms, Dr. Thompson was stumped and had no idea what could possibly be wrong with him. So Rodney left, but he came back shortly after because his symptoms just kept getting worse and worse. When he arrived to the doctor for the second time, he was becoming increasingly anxious and was really worried about how bad his symptoms were getting. He had unbelievable stomach and joint pain Pain. His eyes were so painful and sensitive that he had to wear sunglasses even though the sun hadn't come up in Antarctica in months. Dr. Thompson was baffled and he could not think of a single diagnosis that could explain these bizarre symptoms. The medical team started to try and use the internet or their satellite phone to contact someone or use any outside resources to figure out what was happening, but the internet was down at the time. Of course, given the locations, both the internet and phones would lose connection regularly every single day. So at this point, they had absolutely no connection to the outside world for any help. Dr. Thompson racked his brain trying to figure out what was happening to Rodney. At one point, he thought that maybe these were symptoms of alcohol withdrawal. Now, Rodney did have Tourette syndrome, which is a nervous system disorder that causes people to make sudden movements or sounds called tics that they cannot control. So at one point, Rodney did try to use alcohol to cope with his disorder. Another thought was that maybe these symptoms were manifestations of severe anxiety. Now, it is very common for researchers in Antarctica to experience severe anxiety. Not only are they bored from being so isolated, many times they experience claustrophobia, and on top of that, their body has to adjust to it constantly either being day or night at all time. And in Rodney's case, it was dark 24 seven. Their whole circadian rhythm is completely thrown off of whack and a lot of their hormones and physiological bodily processes are controlled by the sun's light and dark schedule. So when their hormones and their body is completely thrown off like this, on top of everything else that they have to deal with, a lot of these people are victims to severe anxiety. Many researchers similar to Rodney have become very irritable, sensitive, and aggressive while trying to deal with these changes. So again, at this point, Rodney was incredibly anxious and distressed and was kind of freaking out. So without having any other diagnosis or clinical reasoning for these symptoms, Dr. Thompson decided to inject Mark with a sedative. This calmed down Rodney enough that he did feel a little bit better, so he decided to go home and rest in his own bed for the night. However, as he lay there in bed next to his fiance Sonia, he just got more and more anxious and scared again, and he started to feel absolutely horrible again. He once again started to puke blood. His breathing became very fast and shallow and labored. His joints were just throbbing at this point and his stomach was excruciatingly painful. Him and Sonia again started to make their way back to the doctor. He was just stumbling around these dimly lit tunnels, was pretty disoriented, and was almost completely losing his vision. He finally made it back to the doctor and at this point he was extremely agitated to the point of hyperventilation and he was starting to get combative. So this time Dr. Thompson opted to give him yet another injection. This time of Haldol, which is a very powerful antipsychotic to try and gain control of Rodney. As it started to take effect, it did calm him down, so he decided to lay down, but this time he started dozing off and was losing consciousness. His breathing started to slow down and he looked as if he was finally starting to become at peace. He held Sonia's hand and for a moment, it seemed like things were finally starting to get better. However, that was not the case. Shortly after receiving this injection, Rodney went into a cardiac arrest. The station set off their emergency alarm and soon arrived the trauma team. Now, the trauma team was made up of volunteers who were trained in how to respond to this type of situation, but not all of them had a medical background. Some of them were scientists, other were mechanics. A man named Darren Schneider, who we mentioned earlier that was a great friend of Rodney, and the only other physicist that was from Australia was the first to arrive. 
At this point, Sonia had been holding the ventilator bag and pushing breaths into Rodney's mouth, but then Darren took over. Again, him and Rodney were great friends, so he was trying desperately to save his life. The rest of the trauma team arrived shortly after and they were scrambling to do absolutely everything, anything that they could to save Rodney's life. However, after 45 minutes of resuscitation attempts at 6.45 p.m. on May 12, 2000, Rodney Marks was dead. Now, even still, Dr. Thompson was absolutely baffled and had no idea what could have happened to Rodney. So for the time being, they labeled his death as being from natural causes, something like a massive heart attack or a stroke. Now, like I said earlier, for many months out of the year, it is too cold in Antarctica for even a plane to land. And Dr. Thompson was not a coroner, he was a physician, so there was no way that he could have done an autopsy. So of course, this was the time in the year that it was impossible to land a plane, so they actually had to wait five months until October before a plane could come to the station to retrieve Rodney's body. So people at the base actually used their free time to gather oak scraps and built them into a casket for Rodney. They laid his body to rest and stored him outside where the negative 85 degree Fahrenheit weather would preserve his body until the plane arrived. Until then, the 48 other people on base mourned the death of their fallen colleague and recalled the good times. By October 30th, flights resumed to Antarctica and a plane arrived to transport Rodney's body. They took him to Christchurch, New Zealand, where forensic pathologist Dr. Sage Martin performed the autopsy. By mid-December, the autopsy was complete and Dr. Sage had some disturbing news. Rodney had been in very good health before his death and did not die of natural causes. Dr. Sage found about 150 milliliters of a colorless, odorless, and sweet-tasting methanol in Rodney's system. Methanol is used to produce chemicals such as formaldehyde, which is then used in adhesives, windshield washer fluid, and was commonly used at the research facility to clean scientific equipment. Dr. Sage ruled his death as a result of methanol poisoning after consuming it probably one to two days before his death. So by the time he was exhibiting all of these symptoms and visited the doctor, his body had it converted the methanol into formic acid, which caused metabolic acidosis, which is what caused all of these symptoms. Dr. Sage thought that Rodney probably did not know that he had consumed methanol because again, it is virtually tasteless. When the news broke about Rodney's cause of death, Rodney's colleagues at the station were absolutely Absolutely shocked. This entire time, they thought that he died of natural causes, and now they were finding out that he somehow consumed methanol. Of course, immediately, many people jumped to assuming that Rodney had purposely drank the methanol himself to take his own life. No one at the station could possibly imagine someone slipping it into his drink, but then, at the same time, no one could imagine why Rodney would want to take his own life either. Yeah, life in Antarctica was really tough, but he had already spent an entire year there previously and he loved it so much that he chose to come back. He went into it knowing exactly what to expect and I imagine if it caused him a great bit of anxiety and suicidal thoughts in the first time, he definitely would not have chosen to go back. He was working on important research that he absolutely loved doing. He was surrounded by friends who loved him as well as a fiance that he was so excited excited to be getting married too soon. Plus, Rodney had requested medical care three times within 36 hours and was desperately trying to figure out what was wrong with him. So it just did not look like he took this on purpose and did this to himself because he genuinely seemed like he had absolutely no idea what was happening to him. Now, Antarctica is actually governed by a treaty signed by 54 nations. Rodney himself was from Australia. He worked at an American base, but he died at the Ross Dependency, which is territory owned by New Zealand. So trying to figure out who exactly was going to take on Rodney's case was a total mess, but ultimately New Zealand did end up taking the case. Detectives on the case considered several different theories as to how Rodney died. Maybe he drank the methanol by accident. Maybe he actually drank it on purpose, but for fun. Maybe he drank it with the intention of taking his life, or maybe someone slipped it into his drink. 
to detectives, the least likely theory was him drinking it in order to take his own life because again, he had an amazing career that he loved and he was overall very happy and a very positive man. Then obviously again, we know that he had requested medical care several times and had no idea what was going on to his body. The next thought by detectives was that maybe he did drink it on purpose, but with the intention to get high and then accidentally drank too much without knowing it. The reason for this theory again was because Rodney was known to use alcohol to cope with his Tourette syndrome. However, the same fact could be exactly what points directly away from this theory. If Rodney wanted to self-medicate, he had access to plenty of alcohol on base. Plus, he is a brilliant scientist who knows very well that methanol is a poison and can harm you and knows not to mess with that stuff. Even if he was dealing with some very difficult things and just wanted to try a new way to get high, he would have known how much to drink and how much was too much and how much was going to poison him. Plus, again, this keeps coming back, but we know that he visited the doctor several times and had no idea what was happening to him. And if he knew in his head that he had drank in methanol, he would have told the doctor that to try and get it out of the system or to request a blood draw or something. So the most likely scenario based on what we know is that he most likely ingested this methanol unknowingly, but that still leaves us with the biggest question of all, which is, was it an accident or did someone do this to him? However, many scientists on base have come out saying that they do not believe that it's possible that he could have accidentally ingested this. Really, the only methanol on base was used for cleaning solution and it was heavily diluted in this cleaning solution, so they don't think that there's any way he could have accidentally drank enough to actually take his life. So during the investigation, some things about how Rodney was treated at the doctor came to light and they were a little bit concerning. Another doctor at a nearby Antarctica station had reviewed the notes from these visits and noted some treatments that weren't done that should have been. First of all, in that hospital, they have a blood analyzer, which Dr. Thompson had full access to. If his blood was drawn, the machine would have detected the methanol in his system. This easily could have given the doctor the answers that he needed to find the appropriate treatment. However, Dr. Thompson had stated that the machine was actually shut off to save battery life, and in order to get the machine back on, he would have needed to recalibrate it, which could take up to eight hours. He also said that he was too busy at that point and that this machine was much too difficult to maintain. But the other doctor disputed this claim, saying, that the machine was actually very easy and straightforward to use and that if he needed help, he could have easily called the technical support line. But again, we know that the night that Rodney was having these symptoms, the phones were out of service, so there wasn't any way that he could have called. But whether he had access to it that specific night or not, he had known for quite a while that this machine was dying and he didn't do anything to fix it. Now, this machine is definitely not something that they use every single day, but it was there specifically for emergencies like this one. So he knew for many, many weeks that this machine was dying and that it needed to be recalibrated. So if he would have taken the steps to fix it beforehand, it would have been available to figure out what was going on with Rodney and it could have saved his life. So at this point, it kind of seems like even if Dr. Thompson is not directly responsible for actually poisoning Rodney, he could be held responsible for some sort of medical neglect or mispractice. Because again, there was a machine that was there specifically for emergencies that he knew needed maintenance. And he chose to just leave it there and let it die and leave the battery turned off. So Dr. Thompson definitely could have been held liable for something. However, after a while, it got very difficult and eventually impossible to find and reach Dr. Thompson, and he's essentially fallen off the grid and hasn't spoken to anyone since this all happened. Detectives also tried to get information from the National Science Foundation since that is who Rodney was working for, but apparently they were not being the most cooperative with police either. They would not give up much information whatsoever. Now, they did try to interview those living on base at the time via a written survey that was sent out, but when they did, only 13 people living at the base out of the 48 that were living there had responded, so it didn't really lead them anywhere useful, so 
the case remained stagnant for quite some time. Now, a report basically came out saying that there's no way to rule whether this was an accident or a poisoning without the proper investigation. Now, by 2005, another report came out that discussed the cause of death and the investigation, but it did not draw any conclusions about whether this was a murder or an accident. But there was one bit of information that came out that was very interesting to this case. So this information was from a witness who came forward explaining that one time Rodney had come back from a trip from New Zealand and had this unusually shaped black bottle of alcohol with Portuguese writing on it. The witness said that he saw this bottle among a bunch of other bottles empty among Rodney's belongings. He said he thought that it was strange and that it did stand out from the rest of the bottles, but Rodney had thrown it away at some point. But this person speculates that maybe this was actually a tainted bottle of alcohol. There have been many cases cases out of places like Southeast Asia and Africa about people drinking methanol tainted whiskey and then dying from it. So investigators inquired with friends and family to see if they could pin down where this bottle of alcohol came from, but once again, they did not come back with anything conclusive. And obviously, unfortunately, the bottle was long gone, so it was impossible to do any sort of tests on it. So this definitely adds fire to the theory of him accidentally ingesting it, but it's definitely not a groundbreaking revelation. Now, I didn't see exactly when this witness claims that he saw this bottle, if it was right before his death or if it was months before, but that can tell us a lot about whether this holds any ground or not because obviously if you saw this a few weeks before or even a few days before and then the bottle was thrown away obviously this is probably not what caused him to die but if it was right before his death and then he just threw it away unknowingly and then started having these symptoms it's very possible that that could have been what caused him to ingest this methanol but at this point there's no further information so that's pretty much where this case ends there have been absolutely no answers about what happened to rodney marks and if someone's responsible then they're still out there just living their life despite what they did to Rodney. Since Rodney's death, there have been changes made within the past 20 years to the station, including psych evaluations and addiction counseling, but the mystery remains and we may never know what happened to Rodney. This is such a puzzling and bizarre case. And of course, being a true crime YouTuber, my mind jumps straight to him being poisoned, but at the same time, it could have been an accident, especially if that thing about him drinking the methanol tainted alcohol could be true. And I mean, we think of only 48 people other than Rodney living on base and he wasn't known to have any enemies. And I feel like it would have been pretty risky to try and poison someone when if there was an investigation, there's only 48 people to look at. So that would have been very risky. But then at the same time, they could have known that there's no police around here. There's not going to be an investigation for a very long time. So it would have been easy, on the other hand, to do this and not get caught if they did it in a very sneaky way. It would have been very helpful, I think, if they did a lot more interviews to try and figure out if he had argued with anyone or if he had any enemies or anyone that had any reason not to like him. But I didn't see that anywhere. I didn't find any of that information anywhere. And it's honestly very frustrating. Again, I have absolutely no idea what to think, but I'm really looking forward to hearing your guys' thoughts, so please make sure to go ahead and leave your thoughts and theories in the comments below. But with that, that is where I'm going to end today's video. If you liked today's video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to follow my Twitter and Instagram, both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week and I hope to see you next time. Bye.